particular. So we're, we're almost on schedule. <coughs> Um, our next panel is on economic development, and it's been moderated by Professor Rima Hanna of the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, professor Hanna is Associate Professor of Public Policy and a member of the Evidence for Policy Design Research Program at the Center for International Development at Harvard. She's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and an affiliate of the Bureau for Research and Economic Analysis of Development. Her research focuses on how to improve the provision of public services and implications of environmental policy on poor households in developing countries. So thank you very much. Uh, great. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I know that I stand, our session stands between a lunch on a sunny day, so we'll, um, we'll hopefully keep the discussion quite interesting. I'm, I'm very excited to be here to be to be moderating this session. Um, in some ways, we often think that there's a trade-off between economic development and environmental sustainability. So it's, it's nice to be here to have a serious conversation to think about how can we promote economic growth, how can we promote employment generation, while at the same time not sacrificing uh, natural resources. And so to this end, I'm going to turn it to the experts. Um, we'll start with Reginald Smith. Um, Reggie uh, is, in some ways, needs no introduction. Um, he was uh, with the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas for 10 years. Uh, he was an administrative director of the Grand Bahamas Island Promotion Board and a regional director of sales and marketing for Princess Hotels International for 16 years. He is has, um, he's an Exuma native um, and was away for a while, but has been back for almost 10 years and is very active to promote economic and social growth through the Chamber of Commerce. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm going to use that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm probably, gonna, after the last session, it's scary to stand up and talk because after my friend Mr. Kant said that five feet of water is coming up under our feet, it's kind of scary. So with that in mind, I'm still going to say what I, what I intended to say about development and economic development in Exuma. I'm also going to make an excuse right at the outset that I'm probably not going to talk very much about the, uh, the keys because I believe that the keys are on a path that, uh, that's a little bit ahead of the mainland and that we have some serious problems facing us on mainland Exuma that we need to address. So how do we, how do we build? mainland Exuma. So that's what I'm going to try to, uh, to speak to. A distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to first thank the organizing partners for affording me the opportunity to be here uh, as, I, as we look to the future of Exuma. In preparing this presentation, I spoke to as many people as I could to get a consensus of where we want to go. It has been said that a sustainable future is not a fixed destination in time, but an ever-changing landscape capable of adjusting to new threats and challenges through product and process innovations, leading to an entirely new experience curve. It calls for greater understanding of our present surroundings and the processes that will ultimately shape that future. It asks that we appreciate the underpinnings of our present culture and leads us to chart an achievable path to get there. As Anthony Carnevale, director of the Georgetown University Center on Education on the Workforce once said, all the data says the same thing. If we know where you're going, you're likely to get there. So I asked the question this morning, where are we going? And what path do we follow to a sustainable future for Exuma? Our approach must contain a strategic view of sustainability itself, one that demonstrates to the average Exumian the importance of sustainability in making sure that we have and will continue to have the water, materials, and resources necessary to protect human health and the environment. To this end, the challenges facing Exuma are myriad. We must therefore establish policies at the civic and governmental level that ensures the sustainability of Exuma as a major tourist destination with strong ties to agriculture and fisheries and a high regard for the rule of law. A restructured and empowered local government that understands its role and is vested in supporting local business growth is all important to setting us on this path. And Island Administrator Archibald Cox will speak to these issues later. 
A brief review of Exuma's history will show that the island, which once led the Bahamas in production of onions and other produce, now struggles to bring in any appreciable crops. Former farm lines have been turned into housing developments, and the farms that are left are small and inefficient, prone to punishing droughts or destructive flooding. There is an urgent need for comprehensive restructuring of the farming and agricultural processes that take advantage of the huge amount of land held in common that could be put to use producing crops for local consumption as well as export. Present fishing methods are antiquated and inefficient. Many local fishermen, for instance, still fish for red snapper using hand line techniques. There is a need for programs to assist the local fisherman in learning new catch techniques, while at the same time introducing him to the need for conservation. Catch limits will have to be set and then monitored to ensure that regulations are being enforced. Properly organized, fishing can become a thriving industry where seafood catches are purchased and stored in good weather, ensuring that there is a consistent supply when fishing conditions deteriorate. This would greatly enhance the ability of the local hotels and restaurants to offer fresh seafood on a consistent basis. And we must manage those resources since studies have shown that in order to have a sustainable yield, the rate of harvest should not exceed the rate of regeneration. As the capital of the Exuma, Exuma, Georgetown is in dire need of major planning and restructuring to enhance its natural beauty and to support a vital but struggling business community. It sits at the southern end of the annual winter cruise range for most sailboaters in the region and continues to attract a growing fleet. Upwards of 300 yachts make Elizabeth Harbor home from October through the end of April. While this hardy group has made some contributions to the community, we have yet to mine the vast opportunities that present themselves to us. A sustainable future for Exuma calls for major investment in infrastructure. The construction and operation, for example, of an inner harbor at Regatta Point would change the face of Georgetown and give access to the many yachts that are now forced to anchor up over against Stocking Island, dredging Kid Cove and allowing for state-of-the-art marinas between Regatta Point west to Peace and Plenty uh, together with an expanded mooring field would bring millions of dollars in new revenue injected directly into the town's business. Doing this responsibly and aesthetically would increase Exuma's revenue potential by allowing for the launching and marketing of a new destination aimed at the lucrative yachting market. Catherine Booker, a marine scientist who now makes Exuma home, says that the health of Exuma's coastal and marine environment is so critical to the sustainability of its future. To risk losing these natural resources through irresponsible development in the Exumas is to squander an opportunity to create one of the premier examples of sustainable tourism in the world and lose the natural heritage of future generations. <clears throat> Exuma, she says, stands to gain so much more by developing responsibly. Town planners must consider the creation of a new commercial business section at the naval base. Construction of a new hospital in that location has already signaled where any expansion in the town will take place. We must add a new administrative complex as well as a fire station, improved police station, and a central primary school, all very necessary to our sustainability. <coughs> Relocating the weekly supply vessels to a new port at the naval base has been recommended and should be completed, bringing additional revenue and increasing the efficiency of the commercial port while facilitating the redevelopment of downtown Georgetown into a multifaceted demand destination. Marine scientists who have been working on saving the environment in both Elizabeth Harbor and Lake Victoria agree that we have the capability and the technology to develop Elizabeth Harbor in this manner without destroying its sustainability. Concomitant with all this is the absolute necessity of developing the necessary skills to manage a new and improve economy. We believe education and training then becomes the only avenue by which we approach this sustainability. With the College of the Bahamas moving to university status, Exumians see the need for a full-blown curriculum here that would attract both local and international students with all the ramifications that a college town brings to bear. Housing, food and beverage, transportation, travel. Yet there continues to be a need for hands-on training, 
for professional certificates as well as degreed programs and the establishment of organizations such as BTVI on Exuma. Education must produce usable skills that are needed in the jobs market. We must set standards in the various trades so that the level of services can be raised across the board while developing programs that will attract 30 and 40 year olds back into the classroom to learn and be certified in new skills. According to the local department of labor in Exuma, Exuma has a resident labor force of approximately 3,500 persons between the ages of 18 and 80. We will need to examine and identify needed increases in the workforce, but there's also another side to this, and that is encouraging the native Exumian, native Bahamian who moves there, to get involved in businesses, to learn the hands-on approach to developing a business. Ken Bowe, an established businessman and owner of Chat and Chill, believes that in order to have sustainability, Exumians must first understand the process that created the opportunity. He points to the work of the likes of the economist Theodore Levitt, who said that the business of business is not to just make a profit, but to satisfy the needs of the customers. Mr. Bowe further suggests that we create more mentors in the business community and bring more persons with knowledge of process into the civil and political arenas. Finally, a sustainable Exuma calls for the development of a business model for the individual communities based on the natural att attributes of the specific communities. And one of the things that I really believe we have neglected in our country is our individual communities. We've allowed them to die. We've allowed the culture to go away. We've not created opportunities to keep people at home. Um, and when you, when you ride Exuma, Great Exuma from Williamstown to Barataria, you get that feel. There are 13 communities on Great Exuma from Williamstown to Barataria, each with extinctive opportunities for touristic development. These communities beg for smart development, driven by their natural attributes and are themselves attractions. We must develop the models and then provide the access. For example, most cruisers ever in need of fresh fruits and vegetables, fresh bread, other goods and services, never venture outside Georgetown. Can't get there, okay? Opportunities to reap these low-hanging fruit have been overlooked by us. Ken Bo again, owner of Chat and Chill on Stocking Island, reckons that the sale of freshly baked bread and pastries alone could bring someone approximately $1,500 a week. Supplying pigs for his weekly barbecue roast means importing pigs that should be grown locally. We must, enc must encourage these communities to explore their diverse potential. We're just left them out there. I mean, if you could, Anyway, I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we, when we have the, the discussion. As we further refine and expand our tourism base, there may be, there may be, no longer a need for additional large multifaceted Anka resort projects on Exuma. Instead, boutique style small resorts like the recently refurbished Exuma Beach Resort that is conversant with smart growth coupled with B&Bs and residence rentals would not only provide adequate housing for developmental needs, but would bring indigenous Bahamians closer to real ownership in our tourism industry, as can be seen in developments like Exuma Point and Shoreline Resorts in Roeville and Gray's Cottages in Williamstown. A small convention facility with a state-of-the-art communications capabilities working through these hotels for small meetings might also be considered. Given the infrastructure and having developed a strong, well-educated and trained professional workforce, we'll see Exuma attracting new foreign direct development, <coughs> development while also bringing home many indigenous Exumians and other Bahamians with additional skills. Knowing the process will produce a new crop of entrepreneurs able to envision the future and see the opportunities. And with proper planning and a strong leadership, a sustainable future for Exuma is not only achievable, but ensured, if we know where we're going, we're more likely to get there. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. So next, I'd like to introduce Franklin Wilson. Franklin Wilson serves as the chairman of Sunshine Holdings a Company and Sunshine's Insurance. He was formerly the managing partner of Deloitte & Touche and chairman of the Council of the College of the Bahamas. So I'd like to turn it over to you now. Thank you very much. I too regard it as a privilege to have been invited to speak to this. When I go to meetings like this, and I hear where I speak, and I hear the passion, 
Trust me, I understand every word he said. To give this group a little context for my remarks, let me say two things. I know very little about Exuma. So, so I can't really speak to what Exuma needs. But I do have a sense of the Bahamas. And I do know Elusha well. And I think the challenges are not too dissimilar. Ladies and gentlemen, I am 20, 65 years of age. I have spent 28 of those 65 years attempting to do a development at Elusha. 28 years. 28 years. You okay? No, it's not to do with foreigners. Because let me tell you something. That's an interesting point, people. Everyone in this room, you see what he talked about? Kenneth Bo, I know. What he said is a profound point. It's the complexity of that that so many of us miss. And I'm so pleased that Harvard is involved in this because maybe an outcome of this could understand the complexity of the matter. And let me tell you a story that illustrates the complexity of the matter. E.P. Taylor, one trip, two men, the mid-1960s, 50s. By any measure, one trip is infinitely more wealthy and powerful and influential on the global stage than is E.P. Taylor. Warren Tripp is the chairman of Pan American Airlines, the largest airline in the world, at a time when Pan American is essentially an extension of the U United States State Department. Okay? E.P. Taylor is, by Canadian standards, a wealthy man. But between the two, there's no doubt who on the world stage is more significant. The two of them had the same idea, the same vision, at the same time. E.P. Taylor chose to do his vision at a place that he called Lyford Key. One trip decided to do his at a place that he decided to call Cotton Bay. Same vision. Very small boutique hotel. Very high end. Okay appealing to a very small group of people, discerning visitors, okay? Adding amenities, respectful of the community. All these things that we talk about, principles for sustainable development, the two of those gentlemen had in the 50s. When the two of those started about the same time, Cotton Bay started with, with a group of homeowners who made the folks at Lyford Key look like middle class people. He had McCone, the head of the CIA. He had McNeil, the head of, of McNeil Laboratories. He had the Kaisers. Today, this is like starting, you got Warren Buffett and, and, and Bill Gates and all. Those are the people in your community. He started out. Who built the golf course at Lyford Key? No one knows that they had. You got to go into history books to see who did that. One trip built, how this designer was, was, was um, Tren Jones. This was such one, life with Cotton Bay developed such a legacy that, that we closed that hotel in 1994. The summer, the, the January before we closed it, it is still written up in Gulf Magazine as one of the best places to stay and play. Even then, notwithstanding the fact that when you put the electric plug in the thing, in the, in the wall unit generating things, you'd sometimes get shock. Because the buildings were built, these were prefab buildings. They weren't the built to last from the 1950s to the 1990s. This man, Tripp, built the airport. Now, I don't want to run on longer. What are some of the things you could learn from this, okay? And when he talked about process, I want to understand the complexity of it. The complexity of it, okay? The fact of the matter is, E.P. Taylor, one trip needed to create a sense of place. I don't care who it is, you need a sense of place. 
to create a sense of place that needs capital. It takes massive amounts of capital. The capital has to be patient capital because it takes time to create a sense of place. Because of, uh, to create a sense of place, you need some sense of scale. My point, you need some basic amenities. For a, it's gonna take time for those basic amenities to be self-supporting. So you need capital, you need patient capital. So when Kenneth Bo talks about investors with mentors, those mentors better be have a lot of deep pockets. Those mentors need a lot of deep pockets, a lot of capital that is patient. You heard when we talked about this? All those things that Reg mentioned for Exuma. I'm sure we would all love to have them. Where's the money going to come from? You go to the central government, they don't have it. Our country today has a, a debt to GDP ratio that is climbing at a rate that is unsustainable. I see before here, we had the minister responsible for the environment sitting right in front of me. There's no question about his commitment to what he was doing. I had meetings with this, I saw it. He didn't, his, he wasn't as great as this when he went in office. <laughs> <laughs> nothing he said, nothing Red said just now, he as the minister would not have shaken his hand to and say yes, and then he'd go around the cabinet table and sit to his colleagues and talk about doing what he's talking. When the other minister talking to him about the problem in Grandstown and Beantown and so on and so forth, all them competing for the same capital. Limited resources. So, I'm close to the end of my 10 minutes. I've given 28 years of my life, people, all Bahamians in this room, all understand you got a role to play. Don't just go to seminars like this and theory. We've got to do something. I'll give you a simple example. You talk about sustainable development. We went to Scotland one time. The highlight of my trip to Scotland was a visit to a place where um, we went to something the equivalent like the botanical gardens. And in this garden, there was a reenactment. I am a Highlander. And the whole thing was a re telling me about Scottish history through this reenactment. And I said to my wife, I said, wouldn't it be wonderful in Eleuthera? I am a loyalist. And now you're telling the history and the story. I am a loyalist. Why can't we do that? I came back here, tried to do that. You know how hard that is to do? <laughs> you know how much capital you need to do that? You know how patient that capital needs to do that? So all these thoughts, folks, trust me, my basic point to this is economic development in these islands requires a lot from us, us. We welcome all who come to this land to work with us, be they Warren Trip, E.P. Taylor, whoever the case it is. But the fact of the matter is, we need Bahamians who are prepared to go there. I'm not saying don't use my example. 28 years is a long time. <laughs> we got over $80 million sitting in the ground. Unless I find 30 more quickly, that 80 will disappear before I get to the finish line. See how difficult this is, people? This is reality. And let me make this other point. You talk about education, but process, man, you have no idea how complex this is, people, okay? I'm a developer there on New Providence, okay? I want to invite uh, someone to just go and see what we're doing. On New Providence, you jump in the car, you go. For me to do this, I got to charter a plane. I got to rent transportation. Simple things. Fuel. You talk about fuel. So you got a car there. We complain about the cost of fuel on New Providence. 
Try it in the loose room. Do you understand what I'm saying? These are the realities. Thank you much. So uh, thank you both very much. I think, well, we've had two very interesting point of views. And I think uh, before I open it up to the crowd, I would like to draw it together a bit and ask, um, ask my own question. Um, so I think from both talks, I, I think what's been highlighted here is that there are a lot of problems that need to be attacked. There are issues regarding health, the education, thinking about employment generation, thinking about um, whether or not the, the harbor should be um, renovated, thinking about investments in these areas. Um, and I think um, we've also talked about the complexities of and the investment needed to do all of these types of things to meet this vision of what the future could be. Um, and as we talked about in the last um, session, we rarely have blank checks available for development purposes. Um, and so what I'd like to do to think more about uh, the discussion and um, to ask my question first before we open it up to the crowd is to understand, well, are there low-hanging fruits? Are there policies or programs that you think need to be priorita prioritized, things that could be done in the short run to improve um, the economic development, um, to improve employment prospects of people in the area um, as a, within the short run in terms of thinking forward about bringing forth that grander vision, you know, 20, 30, 40 years down the line. Um, I'd like to, uh, to open that up to you both. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. I think one of the first things that comes to mind is, and forgive me uh, if I go a little off track here, when we look at what we retain from what we make, Bahamas makes a lot of money from tourism. There's a huge amount of money coming in here. I have often asked myself, why is it that we can't build roads? Why is it that we can't build schools? People, this is, there's a national conversation that needs to be had in this country, not by the investor, not by the foreign person coming, by the local Bahamian. Here's a local Bahamian needing 30 million, but we look down the road and we see money going like crazy. Something's wrong. And until we are willing to ask the question, why is it that we retain so little of the dollar that is made in the Bahamas, and that becomes a concern for us? We talk about Exuma making, somebody said the other day, $30 million contributing to the uh, e economy of the Bahamas. I don't know that that's true. I don't know that that figure is, 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 is exact. But the return coming back to Exuma, to local government, to even manage our situations is minuscule. We don't ask the average islander, what did your island contribute to the economy of the Bahamas? We can't tell you. It's a big secret. Why is that? So I think as we go forward in this process, and I said to Dean and, 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 and the team last night, we have to be sure that this time around, this is just not a conversation. That coming out of this is some implementation, some plan going forward. I want to know why it is that we can build huge hotels here. We can get $150 million to fix roads. We can do all these things. But a Bamian businessman who has spent 28 years trying to develop a property can't find additional capital. We have to look at these things. And it isn't his problem alone, you know. It's ours. It is ours, people. You know, I, I made the silly mistake of running for parliament in this last election. <laughs> Actually, it was fun. But I developed a, a slogan in that, in that, little, ep, that little experience for, for Exuma. And I'm so glad that the Deputy Prime Minister pointed out to everybody today, we are Exuma. We're not the Exumas. We are the Exumas. And the slogan went like this. Many islands, one people, one voice. That's the dream of getting there. That's why his problem becomes my problem and should be your problem. <clears throat> you know, when you talk about low-lying fruits, I'd like to suggest two. We could learn from each what's happening in different islands, because the problem repeats itself. 
I'd like to draw to the attention of this group from Exuma two things happening in Lustra which could be worthy of emulation. And Harvard is here. There's the Lustra, something called the Lustra School at KP Lustra. A lot of stuff going on in sustainability. Um, uh, um, kids, a lot of kids come in from the United States now to go to Lustra School. Harvard is here. Madam, you could imagine if we had in Exuma a division of Harvard School of Marine Biology. A Harvard School of Marine Biology in Exuma. Where they can learn better. We have in San Salvador, the, the College of the Bahamas, the, the College of the Bahamas has the Jurace Center. People from, I sit on the board of Elmara College in Elmara, New York. Kids in large numbers go to the Jurace Center for research. Imagine Harvard having a school of research in marine biology situated in Exuma. Now that is sustainable, that is possible, I would invest in that. <laughs> okay? That's point number one. Let me give you another, and, and there's this case in point, the island school at Cape Lucia. It's happening. Okay, you see what I'm saying here? Point number one. I'll give you another low lying fruit. Holland America, the cruise ship, for years had a cruise ship that docked at Princess Key. Okay? For years, those people came, they did nothing other than lie on the beach. Right. Nothing. One entrepreneur, one entrepreneur named Thomas Sands decided to create, he got a bus, a couple of buses, and he started a tour. <clears throat> that tour has grown to the point where Hall in America says that that tour on the seven day trip is the most popular tour. They do, they go to the Cayman, they go to a number of places, okay? Now that tour is so fantastic. I'll tell you a simple thing. Double reading culture, okay? There's a part of the thing in, in Elusra. You drive past the road, a, nat a native Elusran, they wave. So you know a part of the tour, a part of the tour, they teach you how to wave back. <laughs> That's part of the tour. They teach you how to wave back. And the tourists love it. Okay? The highlight of the trip is you stop at, they had the, the Sands family there, had a place, a restaurant, which for years was flying. There's nothing was happening to it. They got a Bahamian chef. We open this now. The highlight of this thing is they stop there at this place. The main point of this stop at this place is separate from you eat the lunch and all the rest of it, is the conk man. And the conk man teaches you about the conk, how all we cook it, how all we eat it, uh, everything, you blow it, you, everything about the conk. I am a Highlander. I'm a, that's the point. That, yes, I'm a Highlander, that's the point. You could extend it, yeah. okay? The point I'm making to you is, there's some young person in Exuma who can go and learn how Tommy Sands did in, in Eglusra and do a tour for every cruise ship or every people there. There's a daily tour about those 13 spots, mm -hmm. what make each one different, how you, what there, the lady ain't gotta go bake it and take it to the next place. Every stop, this stop, you eating the Johnny cake here, the, the potato bread there, the dot dot. Enough said. Low lying fruits. Uh, thank you both. I, um, now I'd like to turn it over to the crowd. Um, if there are questions, start. Hello? Okay, got it. Um, my name is Stacy Mutri. Uh, I guess it was 
I would like to build on the point um, that Mr. Smith made about having a national conversation. Um, I think for too long we have sat back and let foreign investors dictate our economic landscape. And we need to have a national development policy. It needs to be written down. It needs not to change every five years with the wind. It needs to have the input of Bahamians. It needs to represent what we need as a people, uh, the types of businesses we want, uh, the future that we want for our children. And it's too long that we've gone on um, just all over the place, uh, not having direction in terms of where we want our country to go. And so um, I would like to see that conversation begin and finish and start to be implemented in my lifetime. See, Stacy, I hear that. Trust me, I'm speaking with the passion of 28 years experience, man. <laughs> we don't need no conversation. What is the, let me tell you why I say we don't need no conversation. Listen to me. The fact of the matter is we live in a country. When I was in the accounting business, I used to tell foreign investors, you're coming to a country where the biggest debate in public policy on an, ec an, an economic matter is two parties fighting whose carpet is deep red and whose carpet is maroon. In other words, we want foreign investment. You don't have the risk, for example, that happened in Jamaica, where for a period of time you had one government who said we are socialists, next government say we are capitalists. That's the debate. The payments have settled that. We don't have that debate in this country. The fact of the matter is, we need more entrepreneurship in this country. We need Bahamians to stop talking and start doing. We don't need any more talking. We need someone in Gizuma to start that uh, tall company like Thomas Sands did in Elusia. That's what we need. My point is, my point is, listen, plans, we're not a communist country, man. Let me explain this point to you. We got this point. See, let me tell you something. We, 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 you decide where you're going, man. Let me tell you something. No, 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 let me tell you something. Just let me tell you something. No, I want to be very aggressive here, madam. Because I believe this. We keep talking the last election, everyone talking, we need a 30-year plan, a 40-year plan. No, no, listen to me. You don't, listen to me. Listen to me. We don't know where you're going. Let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. The good news in our country is Bahamians agree on so much. We disagree on some things, but we agree on so much. Everyone in this country know, happens to know what, what political party I support. Everyone knows this was a minister in the former government. Some of my best meetings with any cabinet minister of any party was with, was with this man. He and I didn't agree when we talked about much. I could tell you all a story. This is the minister. I will always remember this. My daughter, my lawyer, who happens to be my daughter, goes into the meeting with this man to talk about the Subdivisions Act. To talk about the Subdivisions Act, okay? He was driving an important matter of public policy, okay? The fact of the matter is, he goes there. I'll never forget it. I told her to, to write this up and put this on the wall. He came out, he says, Mr. Smith, here's a dollar. I want to retain you to be on my side as we go through this. He wasn't fighting her. I was a developer. She was there as the lawyer for our rock homes. He understood the need for, for balance between sustainability and all the rest of it. This was the, there was no debate on this. There's no minister in any government that I know who is anti the basic policies that I've heard outlined here today. No government minister. We don't need to debate that. Yeah, we do. I, um, okay, so why don't I, Reggie? Why don't you comment, and then we'll go back to the crowd. And, and I have a, I have a great respect for my friend, Mr. Wilson. Um, but, but here's the problem that I think we find in our country: too few of us are talking for too many of us. We are not engaged people. That is the problem. Nassau seems to be the center of the world. There are 29 other islands in this world. Let me, I'm 70 years old. I've traveled all over the world, okay? I've been involved in various businesses. I've started businesses of my own. I've been successful in some, and I've failed in a lot, okay? But you know the problem I find when I go to my own people? 
We talk about each other, but we do not talk to each other. The message never gets across. This is the problem. And we sit there, and I'll be very, I'll be very plain. We sit there, and we complain about the foreign guy coming into our country. Let me tell you something, people. We will not support one another ever, but we will run to support the first foreign person that comes in. Is that true? Don't be afraid. Now, this, is a, this symposium is here to find results. So be honest with ourselves, okay? And I understand when Mr. Wilson says we don't need a conversation to do this. You're listening to one of the more brilliant people in this country who's been very successful, okay? And he's had access to some very high levels. You don't have that, okay? And you know why you don't have it? Because unlike him, your voice is not heard. You're not out there making it happen. You can go in this country and do anything. Nobody demonstrates about it. No one complains about it, okay? But you complain about the guy who comes in here and makes things happen, okay? And if they didn't come, very little would happen. We have to stop this. So, you know, I respectfully disagree with my friend. There is a conversation that has to be had. That's what we're trying to do with the Chamber of Commerce in Exuma right now. And, and Mr. Bodie is here. I asked him, he's secretary of the Exuma Chamber of Commerce. Go around and talk to businessmen. We don't even have a sense of community. So how can you make things happen? Come on. That conversation that I'm talking about, okay, is one that is very necessary at a very low level. We have to start in the schools. And I see my friend, Mr. DeVoe, sitting here, and I know what he's gone through. I see his wife sitting here. She was on the board of one of the greatest opportunities we had. You talked about the island school. PIMS was in, in, in Lee's Talking Island for many, many years. Ask us how many of us knew what went on at PIMS. Very few people. And PIMS now is gone. We lost it. And not a whimper came out of Exuma to say that research Th that research station has to stay there. Much, much, much conversation going on. We still have a few more questions on the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Rochelle. My name is Danielle Gibson. I'm the Director of Government Relations and Outreach for the Island School, Cape Luther Institute, and Deep Creek Middle School. Um, we're talking about economics and national development. And when you talk about a model for sustainability, one of the reasons I left um, my government job is because I saw that model at the island school. The island school started out in tents. And almost 15 years later, we have almost 15 buildings. We are the center for renewable energy in the Bahamas. We have an aquaculture farm. We have an aquaponics farm. We have the first biodigester in the Bahamas. We try to live what we build. We try to build the way we live. We try to live better in a place. And I think that a lot of times the developers that come on the scene, um, you want to build so fast that the communities that you have around you are not going to support what it is that you're building because they're not at that level, because you're not helping them to get to that level in many cases. Um, the development at Cotton Bay, there's a proposed golf course. There is already a golf course in Cotton Bay. When we look at sustainability, while I'm, I'm not a tree hugger, um, but I do respect the environment. When I think about golf courses, I think about the runoffs. I think about the land clearing. I think about access to beaches. I think about just the natural pristine habitat that's being used for this amenity, that we can share these resources in small islands like Eleuthera. Um, so when I think about national policy, that's what I think about. Um, one of the other things I, I would like to do too is um, at this time is just to invite you all to the Island School on April 18th. We're having a conference there um, and we're showing this model to the world. Um, we're already doing it in a sustainable way. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. So I, um, I wanted to uh, take what you were saying and reframe it a, a bit in terms of a question to both speakers. Uh, what you just discussed was an uh, example of uh, entrepreneurship. And I think both speakers touched upon this, and um, uh, despite their professed disagreements, are actually quite in agreement that one thing that's needed for growth and development 
is to encourage entrepreneurs. And so when we see examples such as this I was just described, it would be nice if the uh, speakers could comment to think a little bit about what can be done to encourage this kind of entrepreneurship more generally. My name. Sorry? Well, it's, it's, see, it's not the question of capital. Harvard University is here. <laughs> <laughs> see, 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 let me tell you the relevance behind that, okay? This is so complex, people understand it. The psyche of the Bahamian is what it is. We are conservative people. Even the gambling people tell you, even the gambling people tell you, they prefer a 10% shot of getting $1 than a 1 in 100% shot of getting a million dollars. In our capital markets, we don't buy common shares. We want bonds. Give us the bonds. Pay me my interest. I get my 7% or my 8%. If you make 20, 30, that's your business. We are content with that. This is a complex matter, people. When I said we don't mean a conversation, obviously I wasn't intended to be insulting, rude, or anything else. Obviously you gotta keep talking. There's no harm in talking. <laughs> My point is, the point I'm making to you is, it's complex. We are what we are. The most wealthy people in this, when we talked about the money in Cotton Bay, Hugh Sands at the time was, a, was at the time the country manager for the Barclays Bank here was the biggest bank in the country at the time. He was very friendly with us and very sympathetic to our cause. He saw us struggling, myself and Albert Sands, who was a businessman in South Lutra at the time. He says, you know, fellas, one night over dinner, he said, the sad thing about this is, I can tell you, in the Rock Sound branch of Royal Bank, there is on deposit m multiple times the money you're all trying to get but people won't put it in it. They won't put it in it. So, so people, the point I'm making, Reg, getting back to Reg's point, I totally agree really what he said, Madam Chair, uh, uh, Ken said about this question about mentors and so on. I'm just explaining it goes beyond just mentor. That's the point I'm making. It moves beyond just mentor. Kenneth Bo, when he used the term about the process, I think he might have been, in fact, as an economist, okay. which he is, mm -hmm. alluding to the complexity of the problem, including the fact that when you go to moneyed people for the capital, they are risk averse. Mm -hmm. They are risk averse. So it's not easy. But, we, but I say this. <laughs> I am older than Stacy. I want to see it in my lifetime, too. <laughs> so I keep pushing. <laughs> I have a question, uh, a comment. My name is Michael Pratt. And, um, I am glad we are talking about this conversation. Uh, one of the things I realized doing some work down in Soma, I said, okay, this is an easy fix. I can go down here, Villa Marina, a boutique motel, and I'd be wealthy for a couple of generations. But then I came up to the conversation that uh, I think that needs to be had, and that is really there is no access to capital for persons like myself. I mean, I'm sitting now looking at some of my workers, and I recognize that they can probably build a marina. They have access to U.S. dollars, LIBOR base, which is around 2 or 3%. I have to work at Bahamian dollars, which is uh, effective rate is really, my cost my money is about 18, 20%. I have to find deposits. I got to go look for uh, Mr. Wilson, or I, uh, probably, hopefully my friends at Harvard, like Mr. Wilson say, <laughs> to get my deposits. So the question I have and the command I have is, we talk about sustainability, but how could we talk about this when really the policies that needs to be addressed as well that are stopping us maybe through the central bank where I need to have easy access to capital. I need to have competitive. If, my, if, I have the, if it's easy for me, and, and this is just a point, I could be totally wrong. This I see Ms. Uncle Frankie shaking his head. Um, but I need to have access to capital um, that is competitive. All right? And, uh, and quite frankly, if it's easy for, for, for my staff who is of a foreign descent to come in and do work easier than me, it, it's quite playing that something is wrong and, and that needs to be addressed as a part of sustainability no, as well. See, see, see people again, man, please stop looking for excuses. That's an excuse. I'm being blunt here this morning, that's an excuse. And let me tell you why I'm saying that. 
Look, if you, I have told you the nature of the capital markets in the Bahamas is we are conservative. We are conservative. Yeah. That foreign person who got the money, I would bet you go and check. The fellow didn't give him that money because he liked him because he's foreign. The fact of the matter is, what did he probably do? He saved something. The savings rate in our country is abysmal. Check the central bank figures. You give, if you take all the teachers in the Bahamas together, you give the average teacher six months to find $2,000 they can't find unless they go borrow it. So there's some, no, no, you said I missed the point. What I'm saying to you is this, you have to start by saving. There's another, there's a, there's another, there's, there's another part to what Mr. Wilson is saying. And I need you to hear this, folks, because this is, this is true. This comes from the financial community, okay? One of the problems that we have as Bahamian businessmen in accessing capital is that we don't keep records of our company. It is very sad. And this comes from someone who, I went to a seminar in, in uh, Freeport, who was going around the Caribbean looking f to lend money specifically for people wanting to buy American products from, from the IDB. And what he said was, what they find here, what they find in, in, in the Caribbean is that local businessmen do not structure their businesses so that they can access capital. You go to the bank, and the bank says, I want to see three, three years of records. Yeah, yeah. There are no records, yeah, yeah. okay? Um, a dish, uh, apart from the savings part of it, okay, is structuring yourself to access capital. Now, one of the things I think we want to do, uh, that, that was done, I think, <coughs> through, the, uh, through the Grand Bahama Chamber of Commerce. One of the things we want to do here, that we want to do in Exuma, see, I still think I'm in Exuma, right? Invite this man to come down and have this seminar with the business community. So that we can, because, you know, if you want to buy a tractor, an American tractor, you know, there's money out there for you. But when you go to that man and you sit down and you say, I want to borrow this money, he's going to ask you for records. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, go to any number of Bahamian businesses, some of them doing very well, and ask to look at their books. Ask if there's an accountant. Okay? If I could, if I could offer one comment, just before you do, please, just give me a minute. And again, a part of the disadvantage, forgive me people, I'm a little passionate about it because when you get 65, you don't like green bananas too much. But the point I'm making is this. The, the, the point I'm making is this, okay? The point I'm making is this. Think about the complexity of this. When you talk about, you go to the banks. Look, look. You have heard, all heard people talk about the rate of consumer borrowing in this country and it's at unsustainable levels, right? Well, think about that, people. That's all of us in this room. All of us in this room. Mm -hmm. But the banks, but, but you could say no. Yeah, yeah. The bank ain't forcing you the money. You went to the bank. You went to the bank. You went to the bank to borrow the money for the fridge. You went to the bank to borrow the money for the car. You went. The bank didn't come to you. So my point to you is, but just think of this, OK? Think about this. As a result of this, he says, uh, you're a banker. You have an option to do, uh, a you could build your business model on, look, let me concentrate on government employees with a salary deduction, which means that if you're working for the government, the risk of you being paid, that salary deduction is good collateral. Yeah. I can get 18% on my money. OK. Now, that's one opportunity they have. Reg comes to me. Reg wants to do a development that he's never done before. It's high risk. Okay? It's development. It'll be good for the country. It'll be good for everybody else. But Reg's got a business plan that says he wants prime plus two. Or you can, you know, you want, you want to pay me 5%. I could lend the money to her at 18% yeah. with a salary reduction, or I could lend it to Reg at 5% with no salary reduction and take a risk. More and more banks are saying they can lend the money now. Yeah. Yeah. So you have that crowding out that's taking place, people, such that, for example, Fidelity Bank started out as a first home savings and loan. They didn't, they didn't pretend no more to make a uh, loans for the housing. 
They don't even pretend that. The credit union movement in this country started out to help people. I'm in the housing business. People who come to me with loans from the credit union, I say, what are these credit unions are doing? They've turned them, said they're worse than, than XYZ Bank. I won't call the bank that started it. <laughs> but it's all about salary reduction. And I lend you the money. So I end on this note. And madam, I promise I'll say no more. Because <laughs> I think I'm, my passion is getting the better part of me here. The point is, people, look, man, we're talking about something on which there is wide agreement in this country. I don't know whatever the conclusions would be, but there is wide agreement in this country. We understand we need to protect what we have. We do. We don't necessarily act on that a lot of times, but we understand it. To solve the problems is difficult, but we need to start with entrepreneurship. We need to recognize our conservative nature as investors and some other things. Okay, I'd like to bring in a few more questions. Okay, I just, I, I really agree with you, Mr. Wilson. Um, we, as an entrepreneur, um, Bahamians do not really like to, um, to have a track record of, of their business. Um, I know it was something, a training session that I had to do with like the hair braiders and I had to tell them, if you make $2 a day, you put that $2 in the bank, if you have to take that $2 back out, you haven't established a track record. And a lot of them, had, they wind up doing that and was able to, when the bank said how much money you make, they had some idea of how much they made it within a year. But what I'm hearing is entrepreneurship as well as ownership we have, as Bahamians, have to start taking ownership. We would prefer to put $10,000 in the bank to say, okay, we're going to look at it all day and, and, and get like 2% or 2.5% rather than taking some of that money and trying to invest in some type of business. Um, we need ownership. And um, back on the plan, you need a plan. A man who fails to plan wants to fail. You have to have a plan. But how do you break that plan down. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So you're going to have to take small sections of that plan and um, develop that particular plan in order for you to, at least for a, a, a community, to really work. You may not be able to do everything at one time, but a small portion at a time. And as you perfect one portion, you go to the next portion and eventually the whole plan will um, come to fruition. Can we take that question in front? And then we'll, great. You. <clears throat> no, someone passed it down to you. Um, good, good afternoon again. Um, my company, Experiential, Experiential Education, has decided to reach out for the low-hanging fruit and also to bite, to eat the elephant one bit at a time. As I said before, I'm a descendant of Mount Thompson. Our family has 120 acres um, in the area of Jimmy Hill. And I have recently retired, and I've decided to take some of my money and invest in Exuma. And what, what <laughs> thank you, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> and so what, what, I, what I've done with my partner, we go into schools. We do domestic tourism with the youngsters, because we know we have to start with the young children. We have to let them get a love of their country. Yes. So right now, next month, we have two groups going from one of the primary schools. They're going to spend a day in Exuma. We're going to give the money to Mount Thompson, Ramsey, Jimmy Hill. My aunt, she's going to tell them stories. We're going to pay her for that. My cousin is going to cook. We're going to pay him for that. We're bringing the young marine explorers from New Providence. They're going to teach them how to scuba dive by three sisters, the rock out there. We're going to pay them for that. And on Jimmy Hill, I excavate, not excavate, I cleared away, and, and I must say I used um, illegal immigrants because I can get, sorry, because I, I try to get the locals, they, they would not help me. I was in the bush um, trying to cut to clear out my, my little crab hole, so I had to find the people from Georgetown who would. <laughs> and I would really like for the immigration department to sort of work with us so, so, that, so that we can, in a, in a legal fashion, you know, be able to employ persons who would work. Because because um, our, our Bahamian young men, they will promise to come, but then they don't show up. So you have to get who, who you can find. 
and we were able to clear a very, very nice area that, that we are going to use as a part of the eco tour. And so, so what, what, we, what we really want to do is to, to keep, to keep the, the money within those communities. And it doesn't, it doesn't take that much money. I'm not looking for foreign investment. I'm using my own money, and, and I'm not even looking to get rich. Because if you, if you get into a business with the goal of making money, you may not. Go into a business with the goal of serving a community, of, of making a dream come true, realizing that. And before you know it, the money will come. So, so I, I'm, I'm reaching for the, the, um, the low-hanging fruit. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I want to share, I just want to share something, an experience I had in Moss Town. And Mr. Gant is here, and, and, and sir, I don't know if you know this. There's a place in Moss Town called the Fountains. You, you, I don't know if you're aware of that. It's up the back of the hill. Actually, it's the top of a hill, or you go over the hill in Moss Town. And there, there are caverns there that are filled with millions of gallons of water. It's, it used to be the supply for the town uh, long before we had running water in there. We suggested to a group of people that that could really be an eco-touristic site. You can clear it out, you can take people up there. The water is cold for some reason, and it's very, very fresh. It's almost sweet. I've had the water. And you go through the bushes, you find a little hole in the rock about a foot wide and get a paint kettle through. You drop it down about 30, 40 feet, and you can hear the splash. And you bring this water up, and it's cool, and it's sweet. And we said, you know, this is the basis of a tour. There's another uh, place there where you can actually see the water moving. And, and I haven't seen that one, because it's through the bushes you have to go to it. But I tried to get that community to cut a path up there, to put in a tour up there, a walking tour, okay, to cut out the old buildings up on the hill, that this community can really make something happen between Moss Town and Hermitage. And we're still working on that. But you know what the drawback was? To get the people to cut the track road. Nobody would do it, okay? And I went to the Outlook, the Business Outlook, and I talked about this. And about three months later, I had a person call me from NASA, from a lawyer's office, who said, I've got 30 people arriving in Exuma. They want to go see that fountain. So I went back to the community and I said, are we ready to go? No, it hadn't been done. And someone said, I need the money to cut the road. I'll leave that story there. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have another question. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Daniels. I uh, work for the Leon Levy Native Plant Preserve in Governor's Harbor, Eleuthera. <coughs> Leon Levy Native Plant Preserve in the Bahamas National Dress in Eleuthera. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Mr. Smith, I guess you kind of commented on my, the question, uh, the comment I, uh, was, I'm about to bring up. Mr. Wilson mentioned uh, Mr. Sands in, in Eleuthera. And that example of heritage-based or nature-based tourism, I think is a very valuable resource that we have in our islands. At the preserve, we serve that function as well as being a nature-based destination for uh, locals and visitors to the island. And so what I wanted to ask Mr. Smith is, I know the, a, the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park provides that nature-based tourism, but what other opportunities are there in Exuma for local persons in settlements to establish businesses or to empower themselves in those, in those communities to provide that type of opportunity for visitors uh, to the island. I saw you, you just mentioned the, the well, but one, uh, what opportunities are there? And speaking from Eleuthera, uh, there is a, an upwelling of grassroots support amongst persons across the island uh, on Eleuthera. Uh, do you see that in Exuma? And if not, is that a hindrance to the development of that type of uh, sustainable tourism uh, in the settlements? Thank you, it's a good question. Yes, it, I do see it as a hindrance. Um, the, the, take for example, there is a place in Williamstown, there's two things in Williamstown, a place called the Salinas. 
it's where they used to make salt, okay? And there's a salt beacon there. The lighters would come in and take the salt out. Now, I've seen this for many, many years. And never really thought about it until I went to hot springs in, our, in, in uh, I think it's Arkansas, and see how they use the hot springs there to create an industry. Well, the salt in Williamstown could actually become an industry. Every summer, people go out and rake bushels and bushels of salt, and they stack it up in their houses and do nothing with it, okay? But you can, you can use the salt as treatments. You can use it to make uh, seasonings. You can, you can make rock salt. There are many things you can do from that, okay? Nobody's doing anything about it. In the, in the, the, there's an old plantation there, and we, if you go behind the, the building that's on the main road, there's some buildings back there that were built by the slaves where the rock, they, they, they were built out of stone, and the cuttings are so incredible that you wonder how these people got them to go together. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling. But you know what's happening? We're breaking the stones down, we're taking them away, and we're destroying the site, okay? Someone could build that into a tour. There's a beautiful beach behind There are many things you can do, okay? Um, yes, there are opportunities in, in these communities, and a lot of it doesn't take a lot of money. You know what it takes? It takes elbow grease. And, and this is what I hope we understand about our tourism product. And this is what Ken talks about when he talks about the process. Knowing how to do the thing from scratch to developing the product. That's the problem. We want the 10% we can make, okay? We want what we can make selling it. We don't care how, that's why you get baskets. That's why we, I'm a straw vendor, and I buy a basket made in Taiwan to sell in my stall rather than sit thin platted. That's the problem. The problem is we do not want to go through the process of developing. People come here looking for things to buy in the Bahamas. They can't find it. I own stores on Bay Street where, you know, we bought stuff from away because you could not get it produced. Or if someone tells you they're going to produce it, they can't sustain it because they're going to work and make 10 pieces and sell that. And when you want the next 10 pieces, it's not there. So from a grassroots level, yes, we have to start to understand the process. How this gets done? And then we have to have the will to do it. And then when we make promises that we're going to have it, it's got to be there. Right. Consistency is another thing that hurts. Good. I think we're going to take one last question before lunch. In reference to uh, Mr. Red Smith's comment about the uh, reward being made to the well, to the water. All we need is a letter coming to tourism or local government, and the road will be put in place. That's what we do, work together to make it more accessible. But we need to be move beyond just making access to these sites and find a way for locals to make money from these sites. And in terms of uh, new developments coming to the island, a lot of times the decisions are made in Nassau before the locals know exactly what's going on. It should be a like town meeting to get the feedbacks from the locals on certain things because what they do is do more harm than good sometimes when they uh, do this development. Thank you very much for a wonderful session. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure, man. Good.